responsive times together, just either hum or whisper. At this time, we're going to uh, partake of our words of confession and assurance. Lord, I'll be on one second. You'll join me. Lord, Lord, Lord how long we break, break free from negative thinking and embrace peace and joy and optimism. Forgive us when we fail to believe, to hold and to see all the good around us. We invite you to begin transforming our thought patterns and help us to recognize, reject, and replace thoughts that do not transform us and blow up. God, there is abundant grace and compassion. People of God, you are forgiven and empowered by God's Spirit to be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the book of Psalms. It's Psalms 106, verses 1 through 6 and 19 through 23. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord, or declare all his praise? Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O oh Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones that I might rejoice in the gladness of your nation, and that I might make glory in your heritage. Both we and our ancestors have sinned. We have committed iniquity and done wickedly. They made a calf of Horeb and worshipped the calf's image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, Wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. part of the wonders of technology. Yeah. <laughs> Just give it a second to go back uh, and we can make it kind of go. We were going to do a meditation today. Maybe we should start it right now. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun. It's, uh, song that I was singing, uh, or that I sang a few weeks ago when we were doing our recorded worship, and it was called God in the City, and if you got to see that song, I put some pictures of Lincoln um, on the screen as I was singing that song, and uh, it's a new song, and but the words, I think, uh, encapsulate hope and inspiration regarding that there's still work to be done, there's still things to do. And uh, it's a good song. I hope that will inspire us and lift our spirits 
as we're going through these trying and difficult days. So this song is called God of the City. Raise your hand in here 
if you think change is hard. It is hard to change. And when somebody asks you, what do you want to be when you grow up, they're talking about a job. But I'm going to ask you a different question. The question for us today is, what kind of person do you want to be when you grow up? That's a very different question, isn't it? What kind of job do you want to have? What kind of person do you want to be? And I want you to think about that for a minute. And sometimes, when we're younger, we can think that it's automatic. Something like a magic wand waves, and when we graduate high school or we graduate college and turn 21 or 22, then all of a sudden, the, the kind of person we wanted to be, we just become that person. Like, I'm just, a, I want to be a nice person when I grow up. All of a sudden, at age 22, maybe poof, I become a nice person. But that's not how it works, is it? You're starting to form habits now that will determine what kind of person you become. So if you say, I want to be an honest person, what should we be doing now? Acting like an honest person. We should be practicing honesty and telling the truth. If we want to be somebody who doesn't blow up and get angry, I'm sure that I've never yelled at my kids before. Is that true? <laughs> I'm a yeller. I'm an admitted yeller. So if I want to be somebody who doesn't blow up in anger, what do I need to start doing now? We start putting into practice and working on not becoming somebody who blows up in anger at somebody else, right? If I want to be somebody who doesn't gossip at school or in the workplace when I'm older or, you know, with groups of friends, what kind of things do I have to start doing now? Just start thinking, I don't want to be somebody who gossips now, so I'm going to start becoming that kind of person now, because there is no magic wand when you graduate high school or college. You're building a foundation, just like our houses have a foundation. We build on top of them. If you have a weak foundation, the house doesn't hold up later on. So we want to start now thinking about what kind of person do I want to become. Let me give you a little, let me let you in on a little secret. When you are younger, it is easier to change and do this. Our brains, and he's going to talk about this, there's a concept called neuroplasticity. Can you never go say neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity. Very good. A little science class this morning. When you are younger, your brains are able to change and adapt more. When you get a little older, it's harder. That doesn't mean it's impossible. We're going to be talking about how you change your brain, but it's not quite as easy. It takes longer to change. So you have an opportunity right now to really think about what kind of person I want to become and start practicing that, because when you get older, it can be a little more challenging. So that's what I want you to think about this week. What kind of person, I mean, you talk with mom and dad, what, instead of what kind of job do you want to have, let's talk about what kind of person we want to be when we get older, and then maybe we can develop some attitudes or practices around that. So I just leave you with that. Okay. Well, at this time, I want us all to just kind of, we're going to do a little experiment. So I just want to kind of take a deep breath in. Take a deep breath out. Just relax. And do that again. Just take a deep breath in.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of our perfect. Amen. Our next reading this morning comes from the New Testament, the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, you Euodia, and I urge you, Synthich, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Thank you. So who feels like they just sometimes are in a pit of negativity and toxic thinking that they just can't get out of sometimes? Does that happen to you? Is there periods in your life where you just kind of get stuck? I know that there are for me, especially during this time of pandemic and politics. Yeah. I mean, people are just going right to the, the, the heart of things that are important, but oftentimes come wrapped with this negativity factor. Have you noticed that? Yeah. And they just kind of seem to be swimming. And as much as I think many of us like to think, no, 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 I'm a positive person. It's just rainbows and unicorns wherever I go. I mean, some, some of those strange people are out there, and, you know, God love them. But I think for most of us, we tend to have that little cloud over our head. Every now and then a little spray of sunshine breaks through, but for the most part, we're carrying this cloud, or we're walking under this cloud under our head. And I want to address that this morning. I want to address how do we, as people of faith, as people who are on this journey of faith, to be more Christ-like, to enter into more of what it means to be created in the image of God, how do we reflect that in our consciousness, in our minds, in our bodies? How do we achieve that uh, becoming that Emily was talking about, children's church? How do we do that? It's difficult. It is difficult because we tend to oftentimes gravitate towards negativity. We tend to be negative Nellies, if we're honest. If we're honest. We fixate on our mistakes. Have you ever wondered why criticisms often have greater impact than compliments? Why is that? Why is that? Criticism, just, just think about it. Think about that. Why? We, we tend to go over and over in our minds criticisms against us rather than compliments. Have you ever wondered why bad news frequently draws more attention than good news? Do, do you think it does, by the way? I, 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 I do Bad news, bad news often gets more attention than good news. You know, there was a time, I can distinctly remember one day, it kind of still stood out from many, 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 many of my days, but there was one day where I remember waking up, I had a great morning, it was a beautiful day, everything was going well, felt good, you know, um, kids were, you know, just in a good mood, Emily was in a good mood, it was just a wonderful time, I think my uh, kids were saying, Dad, I love you. 
Um, I felt really good. And then I got in the car, off to work, I went. And everything was going well. And all of a sudden, I remember, this was a few years ago when I was in education, quite a few years ago, but um, something happened in the classroom where I got criticized. I got criticized. Um, and guess what I, guess what stood with me all day? Guess what stood with me, or stuck with me? That criticism. I just kept thinking about it over and over and over and over again. And I went home, and I remember, and it was a criticism, I, I think from a faculty member, one of my peers or something like that. It wasn't a student. I mean, they could be a little annoying, right? Sometimes they can come aware on us, but sometimes if it comes from our peers, it really gets the grades, grades on us. And I went home, and it, all of a sudden, it just struck me. It's like, wow, there were all these good things that happened in the morning. There were so many good things, and there was one thing that happened that was negative, and I gravitated towards the one negative thing. Why in the world was that? Why was it that I was impacted more by the bad rather than the good? Well, psychologists and therapists actually have an explanation for this. It's called negativity bias. How many of you have heard of negativity bias? Anyone out there? Some of you? Yep. Negativity bias. What's negativity bias? Well, simply what it says. It's that negativity hits us harder. We tend to be three to five times more influenced and affected by negativity than positivity. Or even neutral things, things that we're kind of indifferent towards. Now, when you wonder why that is, there's actually a biological explanation. Our brains have a set of neurons called the amygdala. And the amygdala is designed to alert our nervous system at the first signs of negativity. So when we get afraid, we get fearful, it's that uh, fight or flight response. And many scientists say, well, this has come about through many years of evolution, of having when we, our ancestors uh, lived out in the, in the wild and had to protect themselves. And this kind of response developed in us to such an extent that it just becomes such a part of our everyday experience. And so we can, as it were, blame it on evolution. Is that negativity bias was helpful thousands of years ago when we had to choose between fighting or fleeing saber tooth tigers. But now, not so much. Not so much. Negativity bias is interesting because it happens in three ways. It happens in three different ways. It has a physiological component, an intellectual component, and also an emotional one. We start to feel that negativity and that anxiety in our bodies when our hearts start to beat fast, our muscles tighten. You ever feel like sometimes you're having a hard time breathing, you don't know what's going on? Sometimes we just have to stop and ask ourselves, am I stressing out over something? What am I anxious about? Our jaws clench. Or, or intellectually, we can begin to start thinking and playing that, that that reel in our mind over and over again of that scene that's bothering us. And we start saying to ourselves that we're, why did I do that? Oh, I'm so dumb. I what was I doing? And we get stuck in our heads. And then there's that emotional response. So we can, again, it's a cue that we're caught up in this negativity bias when we're feeling always anxious and fearful, and angry or sad. Just in our emotions. See, all this happens inside of what we'll call a feedback loop. It just goes from our, from our mind to our body to our emotions, to our mind, to our body, to our emotions, to our mind. See? And it just keeps going around and around in this feedback loop. Think about this. I want you to look at this. Uh, obviously, this is all spiritual. That's why that's at the center there. I want you to look at this, though, just for a second. Just kind of let that sink, let that image sink in. Now, if you were to take some time to slow down and raise your awareness in order to identify how this is happening inside of you, this is very important in order to break free from this kind of negative feedback loop. We have to become more aware. So, for instance, in my body, if I'm feeling like my muscles are tightening and I'm tired, maybe even I'm shaking, I have to just notice that. How many of us aren't noticing things that are going on within our bodies, with 
in our minds. We're just kind of like going along and living life at a subconscious level, not even really thinking about what is my body saying to me. Do you all agree your bodies are important, by the way? How important? Yeah, pretty important. What's more important, your body or the nightly news? Which one could you live without? <laughs> Yet, yeah, which one do you give more of your attention and awareness to? Are you with me? Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think I made my point. So we need to begin to, if we say we value our bodies, okay, how are we practically developing awareness so that we can direct focus and pay attention to what our bodies are telling us? These bodies that God has given us, right? So we have to take time to slow down. We have to identify what's going on in our body. Or maybe in our mind, I can identify what's going on with my mind. I, I can, you know, sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and my mind will just be spinning. And I'll have to ask myself, what is going on here? What is happening? Has that ever happened to you? You're spinning, spinning, spinning. Sure. And oftentimes we're beating ourselves up, getting worried. And so I may have to say to myself, as I am aware of what's going on, in order to you know, offset this negative feedback loop, as I, as I become aware of the, what's going on in each of those three categories, when it comes to my mind, I may have to say to myself, what story am I telling myself? What's the story I'm living in right now? Some, some people say sometimes we, we get so restrictive in our thinking, it's helpful to almost kind of visualize ourselves stepping into an expansive space so that we can kind of breathe, like almost coming out of a dark tunnel into a large open field to start to give ourselves some type of expansive way, um, some space so that we can kind of breathe. Because what we find out oftentimes when we're caught in that kind of negative uh, intellectual cycle is that we're, we're experiencing restrictive thinking because we're focused in on just one thing. So we have to kind of figure out a practice to expand our minds to help us so we can step out and receive hope with a little peace. And we keep repeating these things as we identify where the negativity is, and we develop some practices, hopefully we can break free of this negativity loop, this negative feedback loop. Because if we don't, we're gonna have lots of stress and anxiety. We're gonna, we're gonna become people riddled by fear. And, and people who are fearful and afraid are easily manipulated. They can't take control of their own lives. And so there's a negative aspect if we're not serious about this, and if we don't begin to ask ourselves, how can I identify where the negativity is in, 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 my, in my body, in my life? It can have an impact on our home, work, socially. But there's good news. There's good news. The opposite is also true, because when we practice regular self-care through discipline, we restore ourselves and our relationships. And the key is cultivating good habits. Cultivating good habits. That's what uh, uh, Emily was talking about. She talks about cultivating good habits. Good habits yield good results. Good habits yield good results. Dr. Brian King, who was a psychologist, said, our brains love habits. Our brains love habits. In fact, 95% of our brain functions are habitual. Did you hear that? 95% of your brain function is habitual. Why is that? Well, because our brains are kind of lazy. Okay? Habits save a lot of mental energy. Your brain needs to be free to do other things. You can't just focus on, okay? One thing. So the brain has to save mental energy. That's why it likes habits. Another reason why the brain likes habits is because it makes the brain more efficient. When your brain, when your brain develops a habit, it makes the brain more efficient. It's like driving a car. When it gets into you, you're not thinking about it anymore. It's habitual. Just in how do you get into a car? You drive, you're not thinking about every little thing you have to do. Why? Because it's gotten into you deeply in your body. It's become a habit and you become more efficient. I want you to think about something. If we're three to five times more likely to be drawn to negativity through negativity bias, and 95% of our brain activity is actually habitual, what does that mean? 
And yet, three to five times you're more likely to gravitate towards negativity. 95% uh, of our brains are habitual. That means we have a massive proclivity towards negativity. We are wired for negativity. We are wired to be judgmental. We are wired to, to be almost in this ongoing wave of, of, of anxiety and, and anger. But again, there is good news. We have the power to train our brain. We have the power to train our brain to replace old habits, negative habits, with good ones. Every habit, as we saw, is formed with a feedback loop. You could have a negative trigger. So let's say um, the trigger off here to the left. Um, I'm triggered by something. And this, this is kind of a silly one. This is a tired person. So the person begins to get really, really, really tired, and all of a sudden they reach for the coffee, the caffeine, right? Yeah, exactly. Me too. <laughs> right? Go for the coffee, and that's the behavior. The trigger led to the behavior, and the behavior yielded a result. The behavior yielded a result. What's the result? I have feeling pretty. I got some energy now. So basic, basic, basic. I think many of us understand this, but when you think about it in terms of our habits, okay, I'll just apply something to myself. Get on social media. Okay? I'm feeling, you know, a little tense with the political situation, wondering what's going on, wondering how my congregation is responding to, you know, the, the, the right and the left, and wondering about, you know, is this going to be something that is going to be, you know, uh, uh, create conflict. I'm kind of wondering, so I'm triggered. Boom. So I go... I go to my, my phone, and I click on one of my news apps. And I begin to look at, you know, what's going on out there in the world. And maybe I'll go to a news app that makes me feel good. I'm going to go look at a news source that agrees with me. <laughs> Nobody does this. This is just me. I'm behind that. Right? And all of a sudden, I start to feel good now. Because, you know, I got to look at some news that agree with me. I think, okay, everything's going to be fine. Now, whether that's going to actually, you know, make me fine in the end is not the point. But you can see how this is just a, uh, a response that we often have. Whereas if I were to begin to say, you know what, before I even do this, I'm triggered, I'm worried about politics, I'm worried about what's going on in the congregation, the people in the neighborhood. Rather than take it to my social media app, maybe I should spend some time being quiet, meditating. Maybe I should spend some time in prayer. They just spend some time just talking with God. And let that behavior, time with God, yield maybe a reward of peace, maybe a reward of patience. So you see how this trigger, action, reward uh, works? Now, why did I go through all this? Some of you are like, I think I, I felt like I was just in therapy or something. Well, you were, it'll be $100 you can give to me after a good church service. Why did we go through all this? I thought this was a sermon. Well, what's going on? I thought you were a pastor. What's going on? Well, because if we're to have, you know, we need to have good psychology, good science in the back of our minds. If we do, we'll better appreciate the good spiritual psychology that we saw in today's text. Because the Apostle Paul lays out the needed recipe in order to have us navigate and offset negativity so that we can become more joyful and peaceful people. Notice what he said. This is in uh, Philippians 4. He says, I urge Dia and Cynthia to be of the same mind in the Lord. It's two ladies that were fighting in the church. That never happens, by the way, in churches, right? Yeah. Ladies and guys, and it never, never happens, I know. So here, here you have people are fighting, and Paul is saying, I want you to be of the same mind. Think, achieve a place of unity. Seek reconciliation. So here we have the behavior of unity in relationships. You can imagine uh, uh, Yudia, whatever triggered her with her relationship with the other, led to a behavior of fighting. Paul's now saying, listen, I want you to be reconciled. I want the behavior to be reconciliation. I want you to insert that <laughs> rather than fighting. Look at this next one. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let's well, easier said than done. But notice, rejoicing is a behavior. And notice what, by Paul commanding it, he is implying that it is something you choose to do. You choose to die. I know a lot of us don't think this way. We just think, well, you know what? If my day goes according to plan and everything is well, then I'll be happy. Right? 
Rather than waking up and saying, I'm going to choose to be happy, I'm going to choose joy, we say, I'm going to wait for it. And when we do the latter, it never comes. And we wonder, why am I not a joyful person? Because joy is not something that we are to wait for, it's something that we are to choose. And by the way, we do that by faith in Christ. Right? Because I know when I say something like that, people are like, well, how can I be happy? Look what's going on in the world, what's going on in the culture, what's going on in our neighborhood. How can I? Well, as Christians, we say we look at all that through the lens called the gospel. And we're able to be able to look at things in a way where we can still be concerned but not be overcome by that concern. Look what he said also. He says, let your gentleness be made known to everyone. The Lord is near. So practice being gentle in light of the brevity of life. Practice being gentle. Here's another law of behavior. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So here, the apostle is saying that offsetting worry, you can offset worry by replacing it with prayer, with meditation, and practices of gratitude. Verse 8, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, excellent, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Look at that verse. Wow. That's a recipe for mindfulness. That's a recipe for uh, cultivating positive, godly thinking. And what's the result of all this? Well, he says in verse 7 and verse 9, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We're going to have a guard around our heart and our mind. We're going to experience peace if we do these things. And then he says in verse 9, Keep on doing these things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Keep on doing these things. Keep on doing this is a practice. It's an ongoing practice. So Paul is essentially saying that negativity can only be overcome through developing Godly habits. See, overcoming negativity and becoming a more joyful, peaceful person in our life with God means willing that you and I develop and practice good habits. But in order to develop good habits, you have to replace them with bad habits. So, as we conclude, I want to invite you to think about a way to do this. You get to step into some of this. First thing is to identify, just to notice, to be able to be aware. It's so hard to be aware. We're so we're walking around, usually just staring at our phones, usually just worried, usually just reacting to the next thing. But to actually be focused on our bodies, our minds, and our emotions. So just identify, identify where. Sometimes we just have to stop, and that means just sitting down and just do a, do a body scan. Just sit down and go, how's my body feeling? Where's the tension? How's my mind doing? What are my emotions like right now? And as you begin to ask yourself those questions, find out and follow through. Where does that lead me? Where does that lead me? Where does that? Why do I keep always playing this worry in my mind? Where is that coming from? And we just follow it, and we become aware. We need to be aware, so that we can replace. You can't do what Paul said in Philippians four without this process without at least understanding this process. So once we identify, we replace the bad behavior with good behavior. We do it uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. We do it by asking God for grace. And we also do it by applying our human effort and works. So if I get a trigger, my trigger, okay, I'm bored. What do we do when we're bored? A lot of us, some, some of us, will go to our phones or we'll go to the TV. Or the social media. I go on Facebook. I'm bored. I go on there. Okay, I'm a little entertained. And I have a result, uh, a reward, which is momentary gratification. It's just black. It lasts for a moment, right? Maybe I'm gratified, but it doesn't really, it's not really life giving. What if I, when I'm bored, I realize, okay, I'm bored. I usually run on my phone. I'm going to replace that behavior, again, by asking God's help, asking for grace, but also. Being intentional, say, so, okay, you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to do something life-giving, something, you know, something creative. Maybe I'm going to play my grab my guitar, play my guitar, sing some songs, read a good book, read something that's going to build me up. And then the reward is, wow, I'm actually relaxed. I feel good. I feel that was a lot better than 
going into that negative coping uh, system that I was relying on. If you do that, we do this. We're going to experience the peace that the Apostle Paul talked about. And notice this. This is why I went through all this. Look at right in this verse, we have these, these three little uh, steps contained in the verse. Do not worry about anything. So there, whatever the trigger, there's the trigger. It causes me to worry. So you can't worry. Now, if I were just to say, hey, guys, don't worry about anything. See you later. What would you all say? Oh, I can't worry about the pastor giving me I'm worried here. He lost his mind. I mean, what do you, you tell me not to worry, but how do you not worry? You can't just say to somebody, don't worry, right? Don't worry. Be happy, right? No. Don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request remain known to God. In other words, here's the action, here's the behavior. Instead of worrying, cultivate a behavior of gratitude, okay, and prayer, counting on God. So that's the action. That's the action. So instead of worrying, I'm going to actually, maybe I'm going to do a gratitude journal, or I'm going to think about what I'm grateful for. And as I do that, I'm going to. Just ask God for help and, and, and see what happens. Well, this is what happens. Paul doesn't say, and hey, don't have to really kind of wait to see. He says, this is what's going to happen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. We need something to guard our hearts and minds um, these days. And so the peace of God, will, it's not an intellectual thing, but it will guard your hearts and minds. It's, it's an experiential thing in Christ Jesus. So my, my prayer is, is that you keep doing these things. Is that you keep on doing these things. Oops. Keep on doing these things. Keep on doing these. I hope this is helpful. I hope that there's something here that you can be, if you think about, take home with you. Because we need to be prepared as we enter into the end of the year. It's what's going on with politics. It's going on with the pandemic. It's going on with our church and churches in the neighborhood. We have to begun, begin to take the apostles' words seriously. And apply these things into our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. So keep on doing these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's go ahead and uh, close the hymn. We're going to sing, God is so good.
conviction, sisters and brothers, be glad in the Lord always. Focus your thoughts on all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, and that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. And the peace of God, peace that goes far beyond anything we can comprehend, the peace that will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So go from here with confidence and joy to serve the Lord. Amen. Have a blessed week. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to social distance as you all depart. So good to see you all. Thank you for coming. Have a blessed week.